we're gonna get started and we are gonna actually get, so I love, I love icebreakers. So we're gonna get started with an icebreaker. So we're gonna have some tea. This is actually called a controlled oral word assessment test or um, somewhat, uh, some of you might have heard of it as a verbal fluency test. And basically what it is, is it, um, it, it kind of looks into the speed in which you can retrieve an idea or a word and you can um, take it from your mind and verbalize it. So we're gonna do a little bit of an experiment and typically the, there's three letters that uh, usually it's F, A, and S. And for each letter, you have 20 seconds. And in the 20 seconds, you have to think of as many words that starts with that letter as possible. So you do it for the F, for the A, for the S. And then at the end of each of the 20 second rounds, you add them all up and you divide it by three. And what that usually tells you is um, some, some people do the tests in different uh, clinical settings. And what it does, it is detects cognitive impairment in, in patients. So it's a very simple thing to do, but it also is something that can help with the memory. So today we're gonna actually do, instead of FAS, we're gonna do TEA, because this is tea time. And if you guys have like a pencil and a paper, or um, if you just, you know, want to use your fingers, keep track of each of the letters that you're able to come up with words with. And at the end of it, I'm going to have you guys add it up and divide it by three. <laughs> okay, are you guys ready? Okay, so I have my phone right here. And I'm going to have my timer. So I am going to give you 20 seconds. And if everyone can start with the letter T, think of all the words, that, all the words that you can think of that starts with the letter T. I want you to just, you know, if you're going to do it on your fingers, if you're going to like do tally marks on a piece of paper, whatever you can do just to remember. So here we go. 20 seconds, words that start with T, go. Okay, so make sure you write that down because you're going to use it later. Okay, so 20 seconds words that start with E. Go. Okay, and lastly, make sure you write that down as well. And lastly, 20 more seconds in words that start with A. Go. <laughs> All right, so you guys got all of you, you guys wrote it down. So now what you're gonna do is I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have you add those three up and then divide it by three. I want, to, I want you to get the average of the three that you have. So once you do that, I'll give you a second, add the three up and divide it by three. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm trying to let me stop here. I'm gonna try to get to the chat room so I can see you guys. Is <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. I don't think I did good. <laughs> I got a three point three. <laughs> 
so I'm going to, I'm going to explain to you guys, um, the, I'm going to explain it to you guys. So what it is, is if you between 18 to 20, so 18 to 20 should be like relatively normal. If you got anywhere beneath 18, then, you know, the studies will say, there's a little bit of cognitive impairment and you have to go see a doctor. The first time I took it, I didn't do so well either. And when I, when I heard her say between 18 to 20, right, the pressure, when I heard her say 18 to 20, I just thought, <laughs> so um, I think the beauty in it is that, um, you know, the more you do these exercises, the more you do these things, it helps to um, kind of fuse those, those uh, the, you know, the thoughts together. So to make it even clearer. So uh, every day for about four, four minutes, because it, you know, it just takes four minutes, do it, but um, don't use TEA. Maybe you can use the F -E -F -A -S maybe then another day, maybe you can use things that are red, blue, and yellow, or um, fruits, vegetables, and cars. So kind of to keep you sharp and on your toes. Uh, but yeah, 18 to 20 is before you divide. <laughs> so uh, I found that to be very interesting, but I have realized that the more you do it, the more it gets easier. So it's not something that will, you know, you'll see a major drastic change overnight, but over, you know, some weeks, you will see a change. <laughs> so I'm seeing um, a lot of people had like eight, nine, 10, 8.7, <laughs> 7, 14. Wow, somebody got 14, um, nine. So yeah, before or after you divide. So yeah. So you add the three divided, uh, add up the three divided by three, then you get your average and you'll start to see the more you do it, the more the average gets higher. So I thought that was very interesting uh, to anyone that, you know, is um, having a little bit of brain fog. That's a great exercise to do uh, in the mornings or at some point during the day. So we are actually going to get started with our, I'm not going to say presentation, but just, you know, some of the tips and tricks that have helped me this past year. So I'm going to get started with a story. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Alexander the Great. So you guys, do you guys know who Alexander the Great is? Um, do you know, like some, some like interesting things about him? So Alexander the Great, do you know who he is? He was short. He was <laughs> He was sure. <laughs> Maybe that was Napoleon. Wait, wait, that was Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah, I, yeah so I actually don't know how how tall he was. Uh, he was a brilliant bully, the first king of Greece. Yes, <laughs> he was the general of Greece. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a king. He died young. He did die young, and he was a king. And is he was alive about three hundred BC, and it's actually said that. He was such a great conqueror that he ended up conquering um, all of the then known world. He conquered Asia. And when he got to Asia, he realized there was nothing else to conquer. He actually wept. <laughs> so he was, he was pretty intense. But not only was he intense when it came to battle, but he was also a good king. So it says that um, he instituted something called Compassionate Day. So what that was is he would ask or he would invite different people in the kingdom to come uh, to his, you know, to where he was and he would grant whatever request they, they had. So most people, when they came, they got the invitation, they were super excited, they got there and usually they would ask for things like medicine, shoes, clothes, uh, things like that, food, simple things. And you know, one year he, it's compassionate day and he invites people to come and they're super excited. They get there and they're asking for the usual food, clothes, shoes, simple things. And then there is one man. He gets to the front of the line and he's talking to the spokesperson. So they're not necessarily asking the king, they ask a, like a, a intermediate. 
So the, he asked the spokesperson and he, um, the spokesperson says to him, well, what is your request? What would you like the king to do for you? And he looks at him and he says, I want a castle. And the spokesperson looks at him. He's like, this guy's crazy. He's like, I want a castle, but not only do I want a castle, I want a castle, a big palace that has a large banquet hall. And the spokesperson's like, are you crazy? You have a sub nerve to come here asking for a palace. Everybody else is asking for just shoes and clothes, but you're asking for a palace. He's like, no, 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 I'm not done. So uh, not only do, wanna, uh, do I want a palace, but I also want a large room in the palace, a large banquet hall with lots of food so I can have parties for my friends because I have a lot of friends. And by the time he's saying all of this, the spokesperson is livid. He's so upset that this guy can come here and start asking all of these huge requests. And there, you know, there's a little bit of a commotion by then. And the king, Alexander the Great, he overhears and he walks over and he says, what's the meaning of all this commotion? And the guy says, you will not believe what this guy is asking for. Not only is he asking for a palace, he's asking for a large banquet hall in the palace with lots of food so he can do parties for his friends. This guy is crazy. And the king, he looks over to the, to the spokesperson. Then he looks over to the man. He, you know, I could envision him, you know, rubbing his beard. I assume he had a beard. <laughs> And he says, your request is granted. And everybody's shocked because no one's ever made a request like that before. And the king says, every year on Compassionate Day, everyone comes and they're asking for shoes and clothes and um, money for medicine and just simple things. They don't really need a king to do something like that. Anybody could, could fulfill those requests. But this man, <laughs> this man dared to ask for more. This man, uh, sh um, by his his request, he shows that only a king could do something like that for me. So he, so that request made the king feel powerful. So that man dared to ask for more. And because he had that request, though everybody thought that request was crazy, um, he got a palace with a banquet and lots of food so he can you know, have parties for his friends. And I read that story in a book called Daring to Ask for More by Melody, by Melody Mason. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that book, but when I read it, I just thought that it was amazing. And that story actually brings us into tip number one, which is to think big. So a lot of times we accomplish very little because we attempt very little. And it just like the people that were coming on Compassionate Day when they were asking for food or clothes or just the small things, not to say that we shouldn't ask for the small things. God wants to be, you know, intimately um, involved in all of our requests, but it's those big things, just like with the king, it's the big things that make, um, make the king uh, look powerful. It's the big things when we ask God that really gives, gives him glory. So, Tip number one is to think big. If your goals for 2021 don't scare you and make you uncomfortable, <laughs> then you're not thinking big enough. So do you guys have any, any, uh, any goals for this year that kind of like makes you, you know, a little uncomfortable uh, that you, you'd like to share in the group chat? Oh yes, that's one of my goals to you to be debt free. Um, so does anyone else have another one to be debt free? Um, what's another goal that someone has that, you know, seemingly, because I mean, a lot of us have student loan debt and let's say you have $100,000 $100, of student loan debt. You're like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay all this money. So it definitely takes a lot of effort, a lot of faith to, to, to you know, to, to get that down. Driving, okay, somebody said driving to be sin free, get a country home, yes. <laughs> so there's a lot of, of ways that we can think big and driving, someone else said driving. Yeah, so Ephesians 3 verse 20 through 21 says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory, the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. 
And I love that because it doesn't just say, now unto him that is able to do anything you ask or think. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all, all that you can ask or think. Like to me, that's just powerful because God is just showing us that there's literally nothing that you can think of that he won't be able to fulfill. So, and I love how it closes that off in verse 21 by saying unto him be glory. So him uh, granting our big requests that we can think of that actually brings him glory. So tip number one is to think big, uh, really just write it down, think big and see how God's gonna work. So that's tip number one. And the second tip is to always remember to never forget. What does that mean? So <laughs> um, growing up, a lot of us sometimes have a distorted view of God because of our upbringing or because of our parents. So for me, I'm, I have wonderful parents, but of course growing up, um, you know, sometimes parents just do the best they can. They don't really know uh, certain things. So for me, I had to learn that God is not like my parents, if that makes sense. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So I had a point in time where I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. And I realized I didn't actually want to be a pediatrician. I was <laughs> being coerced by my parents to be a doctor. And when I realized that I no longer wanted to do that, I told my parents and my father literally told me that he was going to uh, disown me. And at one point he actually like left the country. He ended up coming back. Um, <laughs> but in a child's mind or in a young person's mind or, or you know, a, anyone's mind, you'll see that and think, okay, um, you know, love or, whatever it is, it's contingent on my, on the things that I do. So as a child, your view of your parents, your father, your mother, um, it is directly related to your view of God. So sometimes, even though our parents love us and, you know, want the best for us, but sometimes they just don't know how to handle certain things. And that fear of being disowned actually carried into my relationship with God. So I would think, well, when I fail, when I don't do certain things, that God is angry with me, that he's upset with me. And that really caused me a lot of like guilt and shame and um, it would cripple me. So I have to remember that God is not like man. <laughs> and even though my parents love me and they do the best they can, they fall short. Um, and that he looks at the trend of my thoughts and my motives. Uh, and he, the my desire to please him actually is what pleases him. And so I'm gonna give you an example. There was a evangelist. This evangelist, he went to a city and he was doing an evangelistic meeting. And the people that he was doing an evangelistic meeting, and I don't know if everyone's <clears throat> familiar with an evangelistic meeting, basically it's someone who comes to like preach and teach and share God's word with the community they'll come to a, a, um, a city and for a period of time, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's 40 days, they will share. And the people that was receiving the information from this evangelist, they were so grateful that they got together and they wanted to give him a gift. So they went to him after one of his meetings and they got him a gift. Does anyone know what gift they got him, like, what, what would you give an evangelist, you know, if you're just very happy about what he's doing in the community and how he's opening up God's word to you? Like, what would you guys give him? Let's see. A love offering. Oh, sorry. A what? Oh no, I said a love offering, like money. Yeah, a love offering, uh-huh. Does that, anyone have one more, like, Oh, okay. A love offering. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that you would food. Exactly. Well, yeah. Food, a nice pen. <laughs> uh, so the people got together and they actually got him a ham. 
So they did get him food. So they, you know, got this nice juicy ham and they brought it to him and they placed it before him and he looked at it and he was so excited. He was so happy. He was so grateful for the gift that they gave him. Now the evangelist doesn't actually eat ham. <laughs> and by the end of the meetings, they actually, you know, started to learn about hell and they started to think, oh man, maybe we shouldn't have brought him the ham, but it was the motive behind the ham. It wasn't necessarily the ham itself, but it was the fact that they were grateful for what he was doing that made the evangelist happy. And it's the same with God. A lot of times we get caught up in what we're not doing or we did this wrong, but if our motive is to make God happy, that very motive makes God happy. And when I learned that, that it was like a, a, a burden lifted off my shoulders. So always remember that us wanting to make God happy makes God happy. <laughs> and also to be patient with ourselves, just like God is patient with us. Um, just like the habit wasn't formed in one day, we also need time to break that habit. So God wants us to be merciful, just like he wants us to be merciful with other people we have to extend that, that same mercy to ourselves as well. So that's something that I've been learning because a lot of times I beat myself up. <laughs> if I did something that I know I shouldn't have done, I, I'm very harsh on myself. But God um, is constantly reminding me that um, the same way that he wants me to be merciful to other people, I should extend that same mercy to myself. And What's wonderful is that as we're seeking to make God happy, we'll learn more about him. We'll learn more about, more about what he likes and the Holy Spirit will work in us to do and to will of his good pleasure. So that's in Philippians 2.13. Uh, and that actually brings us into our next tip. So always remember to never forget, God wants us to be patient with ourselves and the very our very motive of wanting to make God happy makes him happy. So when we have this motive, the Holy Spirit is working in us to will and do of his good pleasure. But tip number three, this goes into tip number three. And tip number three is to, sometimes we gotta check ourselves. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> so uh, this quote is from a man called R.T. Kendall. And it's from a book called Total Forgiveness. And it says, I have come to the conclusion that the primary way we grieve the spirit in our lives is by fostering bitterness in our hearts. So I, I came across this book in December. It was a gift that someone gave me. And I just, I, I looked at the title and I was like, Total Forgiveness, I mean, like, I'm fine, you know? Um, I'm fine, my family's fine, I'm good, I don't have unforgiveness. And because it was a gift, I thought, I'll just read it. And as I started reading it, I realized just how messed up I was. <laughs> so this book is really powerful. So it starts off with Ephesians 4, verse 30 through 31. And I'm gonna ask someone if they could read Ephesians 4, verse 30 through 31. Ephesians 4, verse 30 through 31. Okay, and anyone who, um, who wants to read it can, can chime in whenever. You can just unmute yourself. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Amen. Thank you so much, Nampi. <clears throat> so the very first way that Paul mentions that we can grieve the Holy Spirit is by being bitter. <clears throat> When I read that, it blew my mind because I thought bitter. And then as it goes on to explain, um, I was like, no, 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 I'm not bitter. I don't have bitterness in my heart. Like I'm a forgiving person. 
Um, but I don't have time to go into the book, but it literally lays out the ways in which we can be bitter and have no idea that we're actually harboring bitterness in our, in our hearts. Uh, if, if someone can read Romans 8, verse 11 through 14. Um, actually, uh, just to save time, I'll, I'll read it. So it's Romans 8, verse 11 through 14. <clears throat> And it, it says, okay. so it says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are called the sons of God. So who mortifies the deeds of the body? The verse actually tells us who mortifies the deeds of the body. I'm looking at the chat. So who, who is the one that mortifies the deeds of the body? <clears throat> is it like, is this something that we do of ourselves? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, so it's the Holy Spirit. So if I'm struggling with bad habits year after year and nothing seems to be working, um, then that means I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to do his job <clears throat> and to mortify the deeds for me. So verse 11 is actually a guarantee. I love how Paul is just like straightforward. It's literally a guarantee. So the problem is when we're not, we don't have that experience is it's so crazy because a lot of times like I'll read something in the Bible and it'll be a guarantee, but I'm not really experiencing it in my life. Like I really don't see it in my life. So I'm like, if I know God's word is true, why am I not experiencing it in my life? And the problem goes back to what R.T. Kendall is saying. I've come to the conclusion that the primary way we, great, we greet the spirit in our lives is by fostering bitterness in our hearts. So the problem is when we haven't learned to check bitterness and all of the, the list that it talks about, evil speaking, evil surmising, and all of that, <clears throat> we grieve the Holy Spirit. And when he's grieved, he's not able to dwell in us. And when he can't dwell in us, we can't be like Jesus. So um, I love how it simplifies it for me. So there's nothing that God hates more than when I demonstrate ingratitude towards him for refuse, um, by refusing to forgive other people. And, and Jesus kind of demonstrates that in, um, in Matthew 18, verse 21 through 35, when he talks about the parable of the, the man that the king, uh, the man that the king uh, forgives for much. And that man turns around and he goes and he sees someone who owes him like a few bucks <laughs> and throws him in, in jail. So God hates that, that hypocrisy. So when we are harboring that bitterness and we can't forgive, the Holy Spirit can't dwell in us. And he, if he can't dwell in us, we can't bear fruit. So Galatians 5 verse 22 through 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, what are the fruits of the Spirit, guys? The love. Fruit of the spirit, yeah, love. love. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, temperance and um, forbearing, long-suffering. Yeah, that was the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Nice, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just excited. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, exactly what she said. Um, and one thing, so I, I, as I started to um, really understand this, I thought, okay, if, if, the, if I'm bitter and the Holy Spirit can't dwell in me, I can't be loving. I can't have joy. No wonder I don't have peace. I can't suffer long. I can't be gentle. And one thing that that um, caught my attention was temperance. Do you guys know 
what the definition of temperance means. I looked at the Merriam-Webster definition and it says moderation in action, thought, or feeling, uh, restraint, self-control, um, habitual moderation in the indulgence of the appetites or passions. So if I'm having a hard time uh, drinking water, <laughs> if I'm having a hard time exercising every day or sleeping on time or, um, you know, stopping to eat when I'm full and I'm constantly um, um, like gassy or I have acid reflux. Um, there are, you know, other things to assess, but one of them, something that's most of the time we neglect is, well, am I bitter? <laughs> that's one thing that I have learned to assess. So apart from the, all, the other tangible things, but Am I harboring unforgiveness in my heart? Am I grieving the Holy Spirit? So tip number three is to check yourself. Do a self-assessment. And nine times out of 10, I can tell you, I realized like, oh, like, you know, someone did something to me like last week and I thought it was shady and I, you know, cut them off. And I was just like, I, I just don't want to talk to this person anymore. Um, Cause I, do that sometimes, <laughs> but I'm learning that that is not love. Um, so, you know, I've learned to check myself. And so that's tip number three, something that has been a game changer for me and has helped me tremendously. So tip number four is to begin with the end in mind. So I'm gonna try to, I have seven tips. I'm gonna try to speed this up because I'm looking at the time it's already 8.40. So begin with the end in mind. So we are going to take a look at uh, Luke 14, verse 28 through 30. If someone can read Luke 14, verse 28 through 30. Luke 14, verse 28 through 30. And whenever you have it, you can just uh, come on. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, that all behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Thank you so much, Cass. So Jesus is kind of illustrating the point of beginning with the end in mind. So if you have a vision to like build a house, like you want to build your house, it would make sense to prior to like actually getting the utensils, the materials to build it um, before doing all of that to actually sit down and look at the blueprint, count the costs and figure out how much is, is it gonna cost you? Because if you just have you know $500 and you're trying to build a house, you probably won't get very far. You could probably build a dollhouse, <laughs> but maybe not an actual house. So that is actually very important. In there's a carpenter's rule that says measure twice and cut once. So that saves you a lot of time of having to go back and you know, you're gonna have to buy more materials if you cut wrong. So in Habakkuk 2, uh, two verse one through four, there's seven principles of, of vision. And we're gonna look at it from, from that verse. And it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. So there's seven principles of this uh, of the vision, and if you don't have time to write this down, I'm, I'm gonna send you guys a document that goes into how to write your own personal mission statement, and it goes into great detail, and it has this in there. But the seven principles 
uh, found in these four verses is to document it, to write down your, your vision. A lot of times you'll have like a vision in your mind of what you want to happen, but actually writing it down will help to reinforce it and help you commit to it. Uh, simplify it, so make it plain, make that vision plain, as simple as, as possible, because uh, the more confusing, the more intricate it is, the harder it's gonna be for you to commit to it. So make it as simple as possible. The third principle is to share the vision. So you see how they gave it to the heralds. So share the vision uh, with other people, print it out, write it out, you know, put it on your wall, um, talk about it. Cause the more uh, you talk about it, the more it'll become a reality to you. Um, participation. So let them run with it. So get others into your vision too. Um, and, and start talk as you start to talk about it. And then timing. So it's for that vision was for an appointed time. So set time frames for, for the vision. So sometimes we'll say, I want to do this, but if you don't set a time frame, it doesn't really give you any motivation, motivation or push to actually get that particular vision accomplished. And last and lastly, faith. So it says it will certainly come. So know that as you are working towards it, you're you know putting into practice, talking about it. Uh, you have a time frame, so you're working on it, it will certainly um, come. <clears throat> Next, commit to your vision. So Jaleesa, a couple weeks back, she had mentioned how, uh, developing a growth mindset. <clears throat> it's very important to develop a growth mindset. A lot of times when we, we experience certain setbacks, we stop because you know we have a fear of failure, but um, developing a growth mindset kind of means that you see your failures, not necessarily as setbacks, but as lessons. And also be realistic and be specific. So there's certain things that <laughs> might not be that realistic, but there's th certain things that, um, that are. So be realistic and also be specific about your objectives. So an objective, um, like have action items. So for me personally, one of the things that I'm trying to do right now is become a loan signing agent um, on the side. So for me, writing out my, just to say, you know, I want to be a loan signing agent, to me, that doesn't work because <laughs> I'll just never do it. So I have to actually write my objective. Why do I want to do it? What is my time frame? And then what I do is I start doing my research. So I go online and I, you know, go on YouTube, um, kind of look up people that are doing it themselves. Uh, <clears throat> I look at the qualifications. Do I have to take a test? Is there an application fee? Do I have to get insurance? And I write all those things down. And then I actually put a time frame on the action items. And then I actually do it. <laughs> so, okay, this week by Friday, I want to send in the application and send in the fee. So having action items will help you to actually do it. <laughs> and also telling people about it, like it says, share the vision. Telling people about your vision will actually help you uh, hold accountable, hold you accountable. And after you commit to your vision, commit your vision to God. <laughs> so Proverbs 16, verse three, it tells us that uh, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. So uh, learn to commit everything to the Lord, commit your vision to the Lord, uh, and also learn to see the future in the present. Romans 4, 4 verse 17 tells us that God caused those things which be not as though they were. So as we you know, think big, we begin with the end in mind, we commit to our vision and commit our vision to God we now have faith that God will help us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So that is tip number four. Tip number five is to understand efficiency versus effectiveness. So if you're efficient, you're doing things right. But if you're effective, you're doing the right thing. So I'm going to give a little bit of an example. So let's say we are in a library 
And, you know, we're living in crazy times. So I want to read a book about U.S. history because I'm just like, you know what? If I don't know history, I don't know what to do right now. <laughs> so I need a book on U.S. history. So I say, Cass, can you go to the owl over there, go to the fifth shelf, get me a book on U.S. history? And Cass is like, no problem. I'm going to go. I'm going to get it in less than two minutes and I'm going to bring it back to you. So I'm, I'm super excited. So she goes, she runs, she climbs up the ladder. She goes to the, she got the right shelf. She goes to the fifth shelf. She grabs the book and she's so excited. She goes down the ladder. She runs to me in less than two minutes, a minute and 30 seconds. And she hands me the book. And I'm like, man, Cass, that was so quick. That was very efficient. And I look at the book and Cass gives me a book on the history of Turkey. <laughs> So it was efficient in that she gave it to me quickly, but it was not effective because it was the wrong book. <laughs> so there was this idea of climbing the like ladder, proverbial ladder of success, only to realize that it's propped up against the wrong wall. <laughs> so it's very important to be efficient and also effective at the same time. So uh, to as you think about your your mission statement, your personal mission statement, um, align it with the things that the values that you have, and make sure that you are uh, being efficient and effective at the same time. There's so much I want to say, but because of time, I'm not able to. But I do want to recommend this book. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So effectiveness definitely trumps efficiency because identifying what needs to be done comes first. And then we need to find a way to do it better or to do it more efficiently. And it's better to do the right thing less efficiently um, than to do the wrong thing efficiently, if that makes sense. So understand the difference between efficiency and effectiveness and find ways to be more effective as well. So it's called Seven High, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. And tip number six, we're winding down. Tip number six is to get to the root of the, the issue. So examine the issue, ask yourself questions. Um, look at past failures and look at patterns as well. So let's say like for me personally, I've had this issue of going to bed late for a while. And I know, <laughs> like I've been trying to get to bed at 930. Like I know I should, but something always happens and it'll be later and later. So I had to look at patterns. Okay. Why am I going to bed late and what can I do about it? Okay. So I need to turn my phone off by this time. I need, I'm not answering emails, I'm not answering calls, I'm not answering texts. Uh, I need to maybe, like if you take um, showers in the morning and night, or if you take showers at night, maybe you take it in the morning. That's like time that you can cut off. So examine what the issue is and look at ways to remedy that issue to, to make it so that you can succeed. And also think about getting an accountability partner. That has been a lifesaver for me because I'll have someone, you know, call me or text me at night and say, hey, it's about that time. Is everything closed? Are you done? Did you finish everything? Are you in bed? And having that motivation or having someone kind of um, keep you accountable helps you to helps you do better because, you know, if one time you don't do so great, two times you don't do so great, you don't want to keep every single time to say, yeah, I didn't <laughs> like I, it. Was, yeah. So it really does help getting in um, if you get an accountability partner. And if you don't have one, maybe like putting in the in the group chat, I need an accountability partner and maybe someone can like private message you and you can you can get someone uh, from the group because I know there's a lot of ladies on here. So get to the root. Uh, and lastly, the last tip is to stop and pray. Um, this has been a game changer for me, honestly. Um, and I'm not just talking about like stop and pray when something, when something happens. I'm talking about like specifically noon prayers, like praying at noon uh, for me personally. 
Um, and incorporating noon prayers into my daily schedule has been a game changer. What I do is I set an alarm for, t for noon for 12 and I'm very intentional. Uh, if I'm driving or if I'm doing something where I'm out and I'm literally not home or a, let's say I'm at work with someone I can't, like I'll listen to, um, I'll just, you know, I'll stop and pray um, even if I'm, you know, driving with my eyes open, but still like I'll take time to like reconnect. And what I do is I'm very intentional about it. I actually read a chapter in Proverbs that corresponds with the date um, each time. So I'll give an example. The other day, I it was the 11th of January and it was noon. And I was, I was feeling some type of way. Like I, I, I was troubled in my soul, like in my spirit, <laughs> but it was noon and my alarm went off. So I was like, okay, I'll pray. I didn't feel like praying, honestly, but I was like, okay, it's noon. So I'll do it. So I prayed and it was the 11th. So I read Proverbs 11 and I got to verse 17 and it said, the merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. And then verse 24 says, there is, there is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to, po uh, to poverty. So what does that mean? Like you, to you, it probably is like, that doesn't really mean too much to me. But to me, I was troubled in my soul. And then I read, I read this verse that says, the merciful man do good to his own soul. So the reason why I was troubled in my soul is because something happened and I felt like, you know, someone like did something and it wasn't sitting right with me. And I read this <clears throat> and God is like, you want peace? <laughs> Have mercy <laughs> on other people. And that really spoke to me. And then uh, verse 24, it says, uh, uh, whenever I would read it, I thought of it in reference to money. So those that give, you know, you know, in tithing and all of that. But I saw it for the first time in reference to um, giving um, love, joy, mercy, um, understanding. So if I want to be understood, if I want people to have mercy on me, I should have mercy and understand other people. So it's very, it was, it's very therapeutic to me every time I get to sit because Proverbs is just full of, of wisdom. So to you, you might be thinking, okay, why would I do something like that? That takes away more time from my day, which I don't have. But honestly, it's been a game changer for my productivity because it helps me to get out of my own head with whatever is going on in the day and refocus on my goals. It gives me, um, uh, it gives me uh, like wisdom and different tips that I can apply for the rest of the day. So as I learn these principles, ultimately it helps me learn how to make God happy, which is ultimately my goal. So um, this is tip number seven and I have so much to share, but because it's 856, I want to uh, make sure to, to stop. But um, I do have some resources. So the books that I wanna share with you guys are the book that I shared, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, and also Total, for Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall, and also this book called Daring to Ask for More by Melody ba Mason. And I'm a huge avid, I'm an avid reader um, it, because I realized that one of the one of the things that has helped me is having like mentors and mentors doesn't necessarily mean like a person taking you, you know, by the arm and mentoring you. A lot of times there's so much you can learn from the experience of other people who you probably wouldn't have met. So whether it's by a podcast or an audio book or, um, or an actual book, <laughs> but I really appreciate them because they, it's years and years of experience that is condensed into, you know, a, a, a literary piece. So I highly recommend these books. I know I talk about, um, I, I've talked about these books all the time, but it's really good. 
And one thing I've done to get more books in to be more effective and efficient is while I'm exercising, um, I realize how much music I listen to. I know music is like, I love music and I think it's a wonderful thing, but I realize how much time I spend <laughs> listening to music. So I cut that a little bit. And while I'm exercising, instead of listening to music, I actually listen to audiobooks. So that has been a game changer for me because as I learn certain things, I implement them and I see amazing results. So those are the books I recommend. And I have um, Sarah actually shared the Firefox Life Planner. Highly recommend it. I, I won't go into detail about it because she shared it last week, but the Firefox Life Planner is a game changer. It'll help you to literally plan out every single day, every moment, um, your month, and it has like three month goals, six month goals, it's, it's amazing. You can find that on um, online. And how to write your personal mission statement. I'll, um, I'll share it in the group, in the WhatsApp group. Um, it's a document that I'll share in there. And lastly, um, there is something called a seven day prayer journal challenge. A friend shared it with me and I thought it was amazing. So I'm gonna share it with you guys and hopefully it'll help somebody. So, okay, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys. And like I said, it's not really a presentation. It was more so um, some tips, some different things that has helped me in 2020 that um, if there's something in there that can help you guys, um, I hope there, there could be something in there. And the books in the chat, yeah. So the books are called, I'll type the books in the chat right now. Thank you so much, Sarah Jane. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I know I was personally blessed. Um, I hope you guys were blessed as well. Um, again, thank you so much, Sarah Jane, for just taking the time to just share us, you know, tips that will just help us to just be more productive, you know, as we kind of continue on with 2021. Um, at this time, due to uh, the limited amount of time that we have, we only have time for two questions. Um, I do see Roxy's hand raised. Um, so at this time, Roxy, if you have any questions for our presenter, um, Sarah Jane, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Sarah Jane a question. Roxy, are you still there? Sorry, it was by accident, but 